Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Allen of All Saints Lutheran Church for the message for August the 9th, 2020, where we're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark, which I've called The Remarkable Gospel. I was away for the past two weeks. I'm very grateful to my friend, Pastor Dan McKinnon of Africa Inland Mission for filling in. If you haven't yet checked out his messages from the previous two weeks, I encourage you to do so. And so now we're getting right back into our series. Uh, next week, God willing, we're going to have the first of two outdoor services um, on the church grounds. So we welcome everyone, invite everyone to come and join us uh, with the hopes that uh, after that we're going to meet inside. But all this is, is tentative and uh, we'll be in touch with everyone. And uh, looking forward to seeing those that we're able to see in, in the next few weeks. Uh, when we do these, we're going to do these two shor short outdoor services. And at that time, I'm going to continue to do these recorded messages as we've been doing all through this COVID time. And uh, then we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. So this week, we're looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. And um, beginning with the second half of chapter 9 through the end of the chapter, we've in, been in a particular section of of Jesus teaching his disciples and, and us uh, some aspects of what life is really all about and, and correcting certain misconceptions, common misconceptions of their day. The, the, from the beginning of the book until halfway through chapter 9, the Gospel of Mark has been basically seeking to tell us who Jesus really is and what that means for us. But there's more to relating to to, to Jesus, to to uh, and to life than just knowing who Jesus is. That's core, of course. But how we view life in general, our worldview, our perspective of life makes a huge difference in how we relate uh, to God, how we relate to one another, how we do life. And I, the section that we're going to look at today really captures what God wants us to understand with regard to how life really works. So this week, we're going to be looking at the story that's been traditionally called the rich young ruler, which is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. And we see here somebody, the, the kind of person that we normally esteem, the kind of person that we see really has it all together. We're going to see that he really doesn't and find out through this story what we need to learn. And so we're going to be focusing on chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. But to get the context, we'll be reading Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 1. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did... Moses command you. They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took, him, he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. 
Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for this technologies that in these difficult times we're able to communicate with one another. And most of all, that we can we can hear your word and reflect upon it. Please guide me as I seek to share some of the things that I believe that you've shown me in the past few days and help me to communicate it well and help us all to receive what it is that you want us to hear and to know and how you are calling us to live in these days. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 17, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, before we get into the question. So this story, known as the rich young ruler, is also found in Matthew and Luke. And there are various differences between the three versions of the story. And uh, scholars get into the whys and wherefores of those differences. It's in Matthew that we learn that he's young. And it's in Luke that we find out he's a ruler, which is probably some sort of official. These descriptions aren't provided in Mark's version. Uh, as Mark tells the story, which remembers likely the way Peter told the story of Jesus. So in Mark's version, he's simply a man. And, and what that does is it, it draws all of us into the story. You know, we might say, oh, we're not rich or I'm not young. And we, I know it may not be a man, but it's a person. So it, an unnamed, undescribed person approaches Jesus. Um, interesting, in Mark's version of the story, there's actually more detail, and it's far more emotional than the versions of, of Matthew and Luke, which it's the way Mark is, is written. As I've mentioned before, it's likely this is Peter's version, and it's, it's told in such a way to, to draw reaction, uh, invite reaction from the listeners and the readers. Now, these things about some of the, the differences through the story, and it actually it's quite a list of all the various details that are different between Matthew, Luke, and Mark. Uh, but, you know, people tend to get tripped up over those kinds of differences and then miss the point. And there's a lot here in this story about missing the point because it seems that this man was missing the point. And we're told the story to encourage us not to miss the point. So let's see if we can get what the Lord's point is as we continue to look at this. So notice that this man is so earnest. He he comes and he runs up and he and he kneels before Jesus. This is a a description we don't get in the other versions of the story. And we're right away uh, in, thought of, we're being told how this man was so very earnest. And, and isn't that, that's what we want to be. So we want to relate to this man who comes up with this with words of respect and really wants to know something. And what's, what's his question? He, he, he asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he starts off with, could be flattery, it could be completely honest that here Jesus is a respected traveling rabbi teacher of that day and he's likely asking him a question that maybe he's asked other rabbis it's possible that this is a question that people would ask what must I do to inherit eternal life many of the Jewish people of that day had an understanding that the age that they were living in was called the present evil age and they were expecting a time when God make everything right again 
And that would be the time of the resurrection and where God would rid the world of all evil and bring justice and all the rest. And that was referred to as the age to come. And the life of the age to come is what the New Testament refers to as eternal life. It's, it's not simply about how do I live forever. It's more how, how, what must I do that I could be counted worthy to participate in this glorious forever future? And, and notice that he's, he's thinking in terms of, you know, what is it that I have to do with my life in order to be counted worthy? And so there is an emphasis on, on self. But Jesus' answer to him is, is a bit strange, uh, especially strange to us. It would have been strange to him, but the, the strangeness to him and us are actually different. Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, for many of us reading this, it's strange because we get all hung up in why is he kind of pushing aside this idea, Jesus pushing aside the idea that he's good, but isn't he all good? Isn't he God become man? But it's that's not really an issue in, in, in how this story is told as well as it's not really the issue with this man because he's not saying i recognize you as as god in the flesh and and calling him good for that reason he has this understanding about goodness uh, is is seen in in and how people live and and yet he's missing the fact that human beings the creation which Jesus had become part of when he gave up his divine rights um, and he, he became part of this creation, he became part of this broken world. And there's this, this issue of the state that we're all in, that Jesus became part of, that this man is not, is not seeing and it's actually misinforming how he's going about his life. Because only God in his godness is actually good. Everybody else has, has issues. But it seems this man doesn't seem to think that about himself, as we will see as we, we go along. He, he has, a, the way he's looking at life, his worldview uh, is, is problematic. So Jesus follows up, interestingly, remember he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 19, he says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And so he responds with some of the Ten Commandments, the common directives of God that all the Jewish people would have been aware of. And he's basically saying, you know the commandments, here's what you're supposed to do. Now, why he chooses these ones and not other ones, we don't know for sure. Um, certainly these have to do with doing not thinking and believing and, and, and direct doing. And one of them isn't actually one of the Ten Commandments. Do not defraud. There's actually no statement exactly like this. So is, is it possible that Jesus is calling out something about this man? Now, he's going to claim that he's done it all since his youth. But there's a possibility that either he's not really in touch um, with his own um, with his own issues, um, or it, we don't really know, uh, he claims that he's actually done them. So let's continue, because this is what he says, verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept for my youth, which is quite a claim. He's actually saying that he's done all these things since he was a young person. But we don't know if that's really true. Some people look at the next verse to indicate, they think this indicates that Jesus affirms this, because it says, and Jesus looking at him, loved him but the fact that jesus loved this man what does that say about how this man has been living this is about jesus compassion upon this person are we not hearing that as people come to jesus they encounter a messiah who loves them who's not putting them off, even if this man's being a complete hypocrite, whether he's aware that he's not fulfilling God's commandments in the way that he's saying, or he's just not in touch with the fact that he's full of failure. Either way, Jesus loves him. 
And that's what each of us need to know before we move on here. That when we come to him, we're coming to a Messiah, the Son of God who loves us, who wants to to draw us to himself, who wants to be with us. And then we'll see what happens with his interchange with this man as it continues. He says, verse 21 again, Jesus looked at him, looked at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. Now, it sounds here as if Jesus is still on this on this track, just like the man. What must I do? What must I do? Here, he says, here's what you're supposed to do. He says, I do all this. Well, there's something you're not doing. So th- this makes sense because he's looking for what he must do to inherit eternal life. And here's what he lacks. Continuing in verse 21, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Interesting, he says, you lack one thing. And I don't know if this is one thing. It sounds like at least two, give away everything and follow me. Because you can give away everything, give it unto God, and not necessarily follow Jesus in the way that they were following him in that day. They were literally, his. he had followers, <laughs> follow, literal followers following him. And he was inviting him to follow him. Now, it's interesting, he doesn't call a, each and every person he meets to follow him literally in that day. He calls all of us now to do that. And is it literal or not literal? We're called to follow him. So I is this one thing he lacks, it sounds like it's actually one thing for this man that he was to sell all that he had give to the poor which would give him treasure in heaven instead of treasure on earth and then he was to follow jesus now it it was pretty radical that anyone would say this it it seems that there were actually rabbinical limits as to what a student because that's what a disciple is a follower of a rabbi that's a disciple that there was a limit upon what a disciple was to uh, to give in terms of material goods in terms of following uh the, his his chosen rabbi um and here jesus is saying give up everything and follow me then we read in verse 22 disheartened by the saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions now this this term a sorrowful might be a way to indicate that he was visibly sad. It, it can even show a bit of anger. Like he was really disappointed by this answer. Here he came so earnestly, throwing himself at the feet of Jesus. Tell me what to do. And he says, well, do you know, you know about this? He didn't say actually do those commandments. He just, he says, you know, the commandments He says, I do all those commandments. Well, you lack one thing, do this. And he was pretty upset. Uh, and he, actually went away. He he couldn't handle this answer. And the reason why he went away is because he had great possessions. So clearly he didn't want to give up all that he had. Now the the possessions being referred to here uh might have to do with um his his not so much his cash money and his that kind of wealth, but uh aspects of possessions that provide permanence like house and land you'll see that in a minute because we're going to come back to it uh, in a couple of verses Um, but what seems to be happening with this man is he didn't want to give up those things that provided him with permanence of life and so you know one would think that we could obey god but still retain control over our lives. And this was the thing that the man was being called to do. It wasn't so much get rid of all your stuff, as if poverty is what this is all about. And if we had more time, we can get into examples in Scripture to show that God doesn't call people to get rid of everything, expects everybody to be poor and not have any possessions whatsoever. But there was a relationship to these possessions that this man had that Jesus was trying to get at. And it's, I believe it's an issue for us as well. It was certainly an issue for his disciples because we read in verse 24, at this after the man leaves, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples. So something happens. Now he turns to the disciples and he has a lesson for them. 
and it's a lesson for us as well. He says how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is, this is very, very clear to, to all of us. Now, I know a lot of us don't think of ourselves as wealthy, but if, if you really thought about it, compared to much of the world, if, if, you, if you took all the people of all time in history, um, most of us listening to this would be in the wealthy class. I know there are some people with way more wealth, but for most of history, most people just survived at best. They didn't have anything extra. Now, there's likely people that are listening that are really struggling today. And you know what it's like. You, you know what it's like to be poor, and you might be really struggling now. But living in a place like Canada, we we are counted among the wealthy, and, and we are what's called an affluent society. We just have a lot of stuff. Even poor people today have possessions, more possessions than a lot of people before in history. And we see in verse 24 that the disciples were amazed at his words when he said how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Because this made no sense to their view of the world. According to the Torah, the books of Moses, uh, possessions and prosperity come as a blessing of God. It's summed up in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. We read there, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. It, it needn't be a drag to be wealthy. Being wealthy is not a sin in and of itself. It's our relationship to our wealth. It was the man's relationship to his possessions that was the issue, not the possessions themselves. Um, the, you know, the fact of giving to the poor was all part of, of Jewish life, but it was be, become dependent on, on, um, on the possessions. That's, that's the problem here. And, but to the Jewish mind of the day, to his own disciples, seeing godly people like this man who were also wealthy, they would see that person as a, the kind of person that would inherit eternal life, inherit the age to come. If, if they couldn't, if there's a problem with them, how much more the rest of us? Jesus, Jesus isn't done here. Continuing in verse 24, but Jesus said to them again, children, and interesting, he, he, he doesn't, it's one of the only times he addresses his disciples this way. But as I mentioned at the beginning, in this section, from the middle of chapter 9 through the end of 10, this theme of being childlike comes up again and again. And so now he's referring to his disciples in that manner. He's calling them to the humility of children, the childlike trust of children, not like this man who's trying to get it figured out, he, he thinks success is the way to go, and, and, you know, if he can only figure out the right way to do things. That's not childlike thinking. Childlike thinking is, give me the answer, and I'll do it. Not that kids are always that obedient, by the way. So he says, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, some have said that he was referring to this narrow gate uh, in the city of, of the walled city of Jerusalem, where uh, people to enter in, if they had things on their camel, would have to take off all the stuff off the camel to get through this narrow gate. It seems that's simply made up. It's been around for, it's like a myth that's been around for a few hundred years. But there seems to be no proof that there was actually a literal gate called the eye of the needle. What's going on here is simply uh, uh, an analogy that we could all relate to, the idea that it's that this is an impossibility. Like there's no way you can get a camel through an eye of a needle. And uh, as much as that is is impossible, so much more impossible is it it for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I already mentioned that in, in the scriptures, being rich is not a sin. And yet, why is Jesus making it seem so, so impossible? And he states it so clearly. Why is it impossible for a rich man to enter into God's rule, to be part of God's family, to be part of his kingdom, to enter the age to come, inherit eternal life? 
that in fact he's saying it's absolutely impossible and so then we read in verse 26 their reaction the disciples reaction they were exceedingly astonished they were already amazed when he said it's difficult for the uh for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of god in verse 23 and now they're exceedingly astonished because he's pressing the point even further he's saying people who have these possessions people who are wealthy they're first century jewish life wealthy not bill gates wealthy so basically all of all of if not most of us it's actually impossible for people who have stuff an abundance of stuff to enter the kingdom of god and they're completely blown away by this because this is completely other than anything that they have ever understood and so they ask now they ask a question the story starts with the man asking a question. Now they ask a question, then who can be saved? If it's so impossible, notice, like, these are not rich folks. They're, I don't know what state Matthew, the tax collector, like, what his finances were at this time. Uh, but these were more common people, but they had had stuff. They had fishermen and, and other people. Like, they weren't the dirt poor of the land. They weren't the beggars. They had stuff, like many of us have stuff, and they're starting to see, whoa, if this man, if, if it's impossible for people like this to be saved, what about us? And so Jesus answers that question, verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but with God, but not with God. I'll read it again. With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. See, issue was the original question of the man there was a problem with the question about what must i do to inherit eternal life and what the story tells us is that it's the wrong question there's nothing you could do to er inherit eternal life no matter what you try no matter what you do it's never going to be good enough that but it's not some people think this has to do with um can any of us climb the moral ladder up and to the top of where God's standards are? And if only we could, only, only Jesus can rise up to there, and then he kind of like he pulls us up sort of thing. And that's not really what this is about. It has to do with the fact that human beings are, are not able to, to know God based on our achievements, our successes, and our wealth. It doesn't work like that. Relationship with God is, is accomplished by God. He's the one that enables us to be his children. He births us into existence by being born again through faith, not through the, anything that we do. So when if when we start getting focused on on success on wealth, it's that's an impossible road. That's going to get you nowhere, and it will still get us nowhere. Even as believers, we often think that if we do more, if we work harder, if we have more, then our lives are going to be better. But that's not how life works at all. That man was missing how to look at life completely as Jesus' disciples were also tending to do. Jesus was bringing to people a whole other approach, and it's one that completely relies on God. In order to completely rely on God, we have to, from our hearts, relinquish those things that, that we fill our lives with. Now, it's not so much about having the things or about, about not having things. Maybe it is, if those are the things that are holding us back. And it, I'm going to explain a little further as we, as we get near the, the end of this, because it, it continues on. Verse 28, Peter began to say, see, we have left everything and followed you. Now, why he says that, was, was he feeling insecure? Like, this is impossible for God. And he goes, well, we did it. We did it. We, we did. We did what the man didn't do. Are we okay? And uh, Jesus answers him. Verse 29, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel 
who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and, each, and in the age to come, eternal life. So Peter and the others, they, they left, they left family, um, they, they left their stuff, and you go, yeah, that's right. And the fact is, when you hear my call and you follow me, and it means leaving things that are, are part of, of, your, of your life, God's going to take care of you. God's going to give you even more than whatever, you've, whatever you have left with persecutions. He's reminding them that this road that he's calling us to is not just uh, it's not just the this you know, a sweet road to heaven sort of thing. He's calling us to be part of his mission in confronting the evil in the world. It's going to cost Jesus everything. And in order to walk that road, it's going to cost us everything too. From our hearts, we need to relinquish those things. And, and it's, it's interesting that the, the lists all have to do with things like identity and permanence, familiarity, security. It's not so much cash money. He doesn't mention animals, which was, which was part of wealth in those days. Uh, owning a business, not owning a business. It's something about the family and land that we're being called away from. Now, that doesn't mean we forsake family because we're told in, in Paul's letters that we need to take care of our, of our families and, 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 and not forsake them. But it's, this is a matter of the heart. What is controlling our lives? For many of us, it's just the way we've always done what we've done. And perhaps what we're doing is what God has told us to do in the past. But is that what God is calling us to do now? Because it's not about being true to the things that we've always known to be true to. That's what the rich young ruler, the man in this case, thought about the commandments. We're supposed to do the commandments. We're supposed to obey God, yes. But he was defining his life by obeying God instead of defining his life by trusting God and relying on him and listening to him and going where he wants us to go or going where he wants him to go and going where he was calling him to go. And then he says, verse 31, and many who are first will be last and the last first. And that sums up really what's been going on here. We're going to talk a little more on this theme when we, God willing, complete chapter 10 the next, uh, in the next message. But this summary statement, the first will be last and the last will be first, this is not first in line, last in line. It's first in prominence and then last in, in prominence, place, position. And in their day, like in our day, who do we think are the ones that are really doing well? People of prominence, position. That's wealth gives people place and position and power in life. And she said, that's not how God's kingdom works. It's the, it's the humble ones, the childlike ones that trust in him. They might appear insignificant to the world. They're not the ones that you would readily choose to be part of your team. But they're the ones that God has chosen to do his will in his way at this time. We have to change how we look at life and begin to look at life God's way. And we only do that by relying on him, listening to him, and doing what he's calling us to do at this time. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray that you'd help us to know how to be free from whatever might be controlling us. It might even be our fear of COVID. Lord, has, have we become so consumed with what the news is saying and what we're expected to do and how to stay uh, um, safe that we're not even listening to you? Father, help us to be wise 
but most of all, help us to be faithful. Lord, you've called us to, to give our lives, not to keep our lives. And so show us how to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all, and looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you can't be there, it'd be nice to hear from you. Send me an email, pastor at allsaintslutheran.ca. God bless you all.